Alexander the Great, son of Philip, fulfilled his father's ambitions. In a mere twelve years, 334 to 323 BC, he conquered Persia, Parthia, India, specifically the Indus Valley, and Egypt. Upon his death, his vast empire was divided among his generals, but Greek methods of administration were implemented throughout, with the exception of the Far Eastern regions. A Greek-speaking person could travel from one end of the empire to the other with ease, and this facilitated the acquisition of knowledge about the entire region between the Adriatic and the Indus by Greek scholars. Alexander established numerous cities along his route, all bearing his name. Of these, the most significant was the one at the mouth of the Nile, known today as Alexandria. It was the intellectual hub of the entire Hellenic world, and it was here that Eratosthenes first compiled a systematic record of all the information about the habitable earth that had been acquired primarily through Alexander's conquests. Although Alexander's triumphant march through Western Asia was historically and geographically significant, it did not contribute significantly to geographical knowledge, as Herodotus was already familiar with much of the territory he traversed, except for the eastern part of Persia and the northwest of India. However, the itineraries of Alexander and his generals must have provided more precise information about the distances between various important population centers, enabling Eratosthenes and his successors to locate them definitively on their world maps. What they learned most from Alexander and his immediate successors was a more precise understanding of northwestern India. Even as late as Strabo, the sole information available at Alexandria about Indian places came from Megasthenes. The ambassador to India in the 3rd century BC, meanwhile, a similar process was unfolding in the western part of the civilized world. In the Italian peninsula, the usual struggle between the various tribes inhabiting it continued. The fertile Lombardy plain was not considered part of Italy at that time, but was known as Cisalpine Gaul. Southern Italy was primarily inhabited by Greek colonists and was referred to as Magna Graecia. Amid these vast stretches of land, the Italian region was home to three federated tribes, the Etrurians, the Samnites, and the Latins. For 230 years, from 510 BC to 280 BC, Rome was engaged in a struggle for supremacy among these tribes. By the end of this period, Rome had succeeded in consolidating central Italy into a powerful Italian federation, with Rome at its center. In 280 BC, the Greek king Pyrrhus of Epirus attempted to incite the Greek colonies in southern Italy against Rome, but his efforts only served to extend Roman rule all the way down to the toe and heel of Italy. If Rome was to continue its expansion, its next target would be Sicily. However, at that very moment, Sicily was under threat from Carthage, the other great power of the West. Carthage was the most important of the colonies established by the Phoenicians, who had been trading along the coast of the western Mediterranean since the 9th century BC Carthage had taken control of the western part of Sicily, which had been settled by Phoenician colonies. While Rome sought to consolidate its conquests by granting other Italians a share in the central government, Carthage saw its foreign possessions as nothing more than openings for trade. Indeed, Carthage treated the western coast of the Mediterranean much like the East India Company treated the coast of India, establishing trading posts at strategic locations. However, just as the East India Company found it necessary to conquer neighboring territories to secure peaceful trade, Carthage extended its conquests all along the western coast of Africa and the southeastern part of Spain, while Rome expanded into Italy. In the manner of conchology, by the time of the initial Punic War, Rome and Carthage had each grown into a shell, with the eastern section of Sicily lying between the two. As a result, Rome became the master of Sicily, and then the final battle occurred with Hannibal in the Second Punic War, which led to Rome's acquisition of Spain and Carthage. By 200 BC, Rome had essentially become the ruler of the western Mediterranean, though it took another century to solidify its inheritance from Carthage in Spain and Mauritania. During that century, the second before our era, Rome also expanded its Italian boundaries to the Alps by conquering Tisalpine Gaul, which was considered outside Italy, separated from it by the Rubicon River. In that same century, the Romans began to meddle in the affairs of Greece, which easily succumbed to their power, thereby paving the way for their acquisition of Alexander's empire. This, for the most part, was the work of the first century before our era, when Rome's expansion became practically concluded. This was mainly the work of two men, Caesar and Pompey. Following the example of his uncle Marius, 
Caesar extended the Roman dominions beyond the Alps to Gaul, Western Germany, and Britain. However, from our current perspective, it was Pompey who paved the way for Rome to continue the succession of empire in the more civilized parts of the world, earning him the title of Great. He pulverized the various states into which Asia Minor was divided, thereby preparing the way for Roman rule over Western Asia and Egypt. By the time of Ptolemy, the empire had been thoroughly consolidated, and his map and geographical notices were only moderately accurate within the confines of the empire. One of the means by which the Romans were able to consolidate their rule must be briefly mentioned here. In order for their legions to move easily from one part of this vast empire to another, they built roads, usually in straight lines, and so solidly constructed that, in many places throughout Europe, they can still be traced to this day, even after fifteen hundred years. Thanks to them, Rome was able to maintain its empire for almost five hundred years. Even today one can see a difference in the civilization of the countries that were once under Roman rule, except for those that were affected by Islam. Civilization, or the art of living together in society, is largely the result of Roman law, and in this sense all roads in history lead to Rome. The work of Claudius Ptolemy summarizes the knowledge that the Romans inherited from the Carthaginian Empire in the west and the remains of Alexander's Empire in the east, to which must be added Caesar's conquests in northwestern Europe. Caesar is the link between the two shells that had been growing throughout ancient history. He added Gaul, Germany, and Britain to geographical knowledge, and, through his struggle with Pompey, connected the Levant with his northern conquests. One result of his imperial work must be mentioned here. By bringing all civilized men under one rule, he prepared them for the worship of one god. This had an impact on travel and geographical discovery because the difference in religion had always been a significant barrier between mankind. Rome broke down the exclusiveness of local religions and replaced them with a general worship of the majesty of the emperor, enabling all inhabitants of the vast empire to feel a certain communion with one another, which ultimately took on a religious form. The Roman Empire will henceforth be the center from which to regard any additions to geographical knowledge. Part of the knowledge acquired by the Romans was lost in the Dark Ages following the empire's breakup, but for our purposes this can be ignored and geographical discovery in the succeeding chapters can be roughly taken as additions and corrections of the knowledge summarized by Claudius Ptolemy. Chapter 3. Geography in the Dark Ages Through a gradual process of expansion and conquest, the ancient world came to know a significant portion of the Eastern Hemisphere. This knowledge was summarized in the great work of Claudius Ptolemy. However, much of this knowledge was lost or distorted, and geography lost its scientific character becoming once again the subject of mythical fancies akin to those of its earliest stages. Instead of the relatively precise knowledge that had been acquired, medieval scholars who concerned themselves with the configuration of the inhabited world substituted their own ideas of what ought to be. This process was not limited to geography, but extended to all branches of knowledge, which, after the fall of the Roman Empire, ceased to progress and became mixed up with fanciful notions. They only recovered when knowledge of ancient science and thought was restored in the 15th century. However, in geography, we can more easily see than in other sciences the exact nature of the disturbing influence that prevented the acquisition of new knowledge. In short, that disturbing influence was religion, or rather theology, not religion in the proper sense of the word, or theology based on critical principles, but theological conceptions deduced from a slavish adherence to texts of Scripture very often seriously misunderstood. Geographers of the period as a poetical statement, but as an exact mathematical law, which determined the form that all medieval maps took. Roughly speaking, of course, there was some truth in the statement, since Jerusalem would be about the center of the world as known to the ancients, at least measured from east to west. However, at the same time, medieval geographers adopted the old Homeric idea of the ocean surrounding the habitable world, though at times there was a tendency to keep more closely to the words of Scripture about the four corners of the earth. Still, as a rule, the orthodox conception of the world was that of a circle enclosing a sort of T-square, with the east at the top and Jerusalem in the center. The Mediterranean Sea naturally divided the lower half of the circle, while the Aegean and Red Seas were regarded as spreading out right and left perpendicularly, thus dividing the top part of the world, or Asia, from the lower part, divided equally between Europe on the left and Africa on the right. The Mediterranean Sea was the determining factor in the size of the three continents. Unfortunately, this led to a major error. 
The southern part of Africa was cut off, making it seem like a short voyage to India. However, as we will soon discover, this mistake had a positive impact on geographical discovery. Another consequence of this T-shaped worldview was the expansion of Asia to an enormous size. Since the Middle Ages mapmakers were not well versed in Asian geography, they had to rely on their imaginations to fill in the gaps. They placed all the legends they had heard from the Bible or classical sources in Asia, including the story of two fierce nations named Gog and Magog, who would one day destroy civilization. These nations were thought to be located in Siberia, penned in by Alexander the Great behind the Iron Mountains. When the Tatar invasion occurred in the 13th century, it was believed that these were the same Gog and Magog of legend. Paradise was also thought to be located in the Far East, at the top of medieval maps. Classical authorities like Pliny and Salinus had included legends of strange tribes of monstrous men who were vastly different from normal humans. Among these were the Siapodes, who had feet so large that they could rest on their backs and lie in the shade when it was hot. Sir John Mandeville's mythical travels included illustrations of these strange beings. Other areas were thought to be inhabited by equally monstrous animals, and illustrations of these creatures were used to fill in the many blank spaces on medieval maps of Asia. In his fervent devotion to theology, one author dared to challenge the prevailing beliefs about the world. A Christian merchant by the name of Cosmos, who had travelled to India and was known as Cosmos Indicopleustes, penned a work in 540 AD called Christian Topography. His aim was to refute the erroneous views of pagan authorities regarding the shape of the world. Cosmos was particularly incensed by the idea of a spherical earth and the existence of antipodes, or people who could stand upside down. He drew a picture of a round ball with four men standing on it, their feet on opposite sides, and asked how it was possible for all four to stand upright. When asked to explain how day and night occurred if the sun did not revolve around the earth, Cosmos proposed that a massive mountain in the far north was responsible. The sun would move around it once every twenty-four hours, and night occurred when the sun was on the other side of the mountain. Cosmos also claimed that the sun was much smaller than the earth, which he believed to be a moderately sized plain. The inhabited parts of the earth were separated from the antediluvian world by the ocean, and the pillars at the four corners of the plain supported the heavens. In Cosmos's view, the universe was akin to a large glass exhibition case, with the firmament dividing the waters above and below it, as described in the first chapter of Genesis. While Cosmos's ideas are intriguing and entertaining, they were too extreme to gain much attention or credibility from medieval monks. There are no references to his work in the various Mappai Mundi, which summarized their knowledge, or rather ignorance, of the world. One of the most remarkable of these maps is located in Hereford, England, and its layout provides as much information about early medieval geography as the average reader would need. In the Far East, at the top, we see the terrestrial paradise. In the middle we find Jerusalem. Below that, the Mediterranean stretches all the way down to the bottom of the map, with its many islands carefully detailed. The rivers are given much attention, but not so much the mountains. The only real new knowledge depicted on this map is of the northeast of Europe, which naturally became better known due to the Norsemen's invasion. But it's clear that people knew very little about this part of Europe, as evidenced by the mapmaker's placement of the Cynocephali, or dog-headed men, near Norway, likely derived from some confused accounts of Indian monkeys. Next to them, we find the griffins, men most wicked, for among their misdeeds they also make garments for themselves and their horses out of the skins of their enemies. And here, too, is the home of the seven sleepers, who lived forever as a standing miracle to convert the heathen. The shape given to the British islands is due to the need to keep the circular form of the inhabited world. We'll leave other details about England for another time. Clearly, maps like the Hereford one wouldn't be of any practical use to travellers who wanted to go from one country to another. In fact, they weren't meant for that purpose at all. Geography had ceased to be a practical science in any sense. It only served to satisfy people's sense of wonder, and people studied it mainly to learn about the marvels of the world. When William of Wycombe created his rules for the fellows and scholars of New College, Oxford, he instructed them to spend their long winter evenings singing, reciting poetry, reading chronicles of different kingdoms, or learning about the wonders of the world. That's why almost all medieval maps are filled with pictures of these wonders, which were especially necessary since very few people could read during that period in history. 
A curious holdover from this custom lasted in map-making almost until the beginning of the 19th century, and this is the practice of decorating empty spaces in the ocean with pictures of sailing ships or spouting sea monsters. When men yearned to journey, they did not rely on maps like these. Instead, they turned to itineraries or road books, which did not purport to reveal the shape of the lands through which a traveller would pass, but only showed the major towns along the most travelled roads. This knowledge was truly inherited from classical times, for the Roman emperors periodically ordered such road books to be drafted. Indeed, there still exists an almost complete itinerary of the empire, called the Poitinger Table, named after the German merchant who first brought it to the attention of the learned world. A condensed version is presented on the following page, which shows that no effort was made to provide anything beyond the roads and towns. Unfortunately, the initial section of the table, which commenced from Britain, has been damaged, and we only have the Kentish coast. These itineraries were particularly useful, as the primary journeys of men were akin to pilgrimages, but these often involved a type of commercial travel. Pilgrims frequently combined business and religion on their travels. The primary information about Eastern Europe that reached the West was conveyed by the succession of pilgrims who journeyed to Palestine until the time of the Crusades. Our principal knowledge of the geography of Europe during the five centuries between 500 and 1000 AD is derived from the accounts of successive pilgrims. During this period known as the Dark Age of geographical knowledge, people held wild and inaccurate beliefs about the world, such as those depicted in the Hereford map. Even as late as Columbus's time, scholars clung to these outdated notions, rather than incorporating the new information gathered during the second period of the Middle Ages, when travellers explored Asia, North Europe, and even parts of America. It's not surprising that this era was marked by a lack of geographic understanding, considering that the political divisions of Europe were completely reconfigured during this time. The thousand years between 450 and 1450 were characterized by a series of invasions from Asia that shattered the old world order. In the 5th century, three nomadic tribes invaded the Roman Empire from the Vistula, Dnieper, and Volga rivers. The Huns, led by Attila, terrorized the empire from the east, while the Visigoths attacked the eastern empire from the Dnieper. The Vandals, originating from the Vistula, conquered Gaul and Spain, and established a Vandal empire in North Africa. As a result of these invasions, several Germanic tribes migrated to France, Italy, Spain, and even Britain. This period marks the beginning of England and France as we know them today. By the 8th century, the Franks had established a kingdom that spanned France and much of central Germany. On Christmas Day in 800, the Pope crowned Charles the Great, also known as Charlemagne, as the Holy Roman Emperor in Rome. The Holy Roman Empire aimed to revive the glories of the old Roman Empire, but it divided temporal power between the emperor and spiritual power between the pope. In the annals of the Frankish Empire, one division stands out as a pivotal player in the fate of Western Europe. This was the Kingdom of Burgundy, a buffer state between France and Germany that, despite its lack of natural boundaries, was fiercely contested by both nations for many years. In fact, it can be argued that the Franco-Prussian War marked the final chapter in Burgundy's history up to the present day. Similarly, the Kingdom of Poland, located in the east of Europe, was equally shapeless, and thus a source of conflict between the nations of Eastern Europe. As is well known, Poland ceased to exist as an independent state in 1795, no longer serving as a buffer between Russia and the rest of Europe. In essence, the history of Europe and its geographical evolution can be summed up as a struggle for control over Burgundy and Poland, following the settlement of Germanic tribes within the Empire. However, a significant interlude occurred in the southwest of Europe, which we must examine as a symptom of a world-historic shift in the state of civilization. Between the 7th and 8th centuries, roughly from 622 to 750, the inhabitants of the Arabian Peninsula emerged from their seclusion, which had lasted almost since the dawn of history. Inspired by the fervor of the newly founded Islamic religion, they spread their influence from India to Spain, along the southern shores of the Mediterranean. Once they had settled into their new territories, they began to recover the remnants of Greco-Roman science that had been lost on the northern shores of the Mediterranean. The Christians of Syria used Greek as their sacred language, and so when the sultans of Baghdad sought to learn more about the wisdom of the Greeks, they enlisted Syriac-speaking Christians to translate some of the Greeks' scientific works into Syriac and then into Arabic. 
Thusly did they acquire knowledge of the great works of Ptolemy, both in astronomy, which they esteemed as the more significant and therefore the greatest, Almagest, and also in geography. One can easily understand the great modifications which the strange names of Ptolemy must have undergone in being transcribed, first into Syriac and then into Arabic. Later on we shall see some of the results of the Arabic Ptolemy. The conquests of the Arabs affected the knowledge of geography in two ways, by bringing about the Crusades and by renewing the acquaintance of the West with the East of Asia. The Arabs were familiar with southeastern Africa as far south as Zanzibar and Sofala, though they imagined that these spread out into the Indian Ocean towards India, following the views of Ptolemy as to the great unknown south land. They seem even to have had some vague knowledge of the sources of the Nile. They were also familiar with Ceylon, Java, and Sumatra, and they were the first people to learn the various uses to which the coconut can be put. Their merchants, too, visited China as early as the ninth century, and we have from their accounts some of the earliest descriptions of the Chinese, who were described by them as a handsome people, superior in beauty to the Indians, with fine dark hair, regular features, and very like the Arabs. Later on we shall see how comparatively easy it was for a Muslim to travel from one end of the known world to the other, owing to the community of religion throughout such a vast area. Perhaps some words should be said on the geographical works of the Arabs. One of the most important of these, by Yakut, is in the form of a huge gazetteer, arranged in alphabetical order. But the greatest geographical work of the Arabs is by Edrisi, geographer to King Roger of Sicily in 1154. He describes the world somewhat after the manner of Ptolemy, but with modifications of some interest. He divides the world into seven horizontal strips, known as climates, and ranging from the equator to the British Isles. These strips are divided into eleven sections, like a chessboard with seventy-seven squares, according to Edrisi's vision. His work entails a detailed description of each square, one by one, with each climate being covered in turn. France may be found in the eighth and ninth squares, as well as in the sixteenth and seventeenth. This method was not intended to provide a clear understanding of separate countries. When the Arabs, or any of the ancient or medieval writers, wanted to describe a land, they wrote about the tribe or nation inhabiting it, not about the position of the towns within it. In other words, they made a clear distinction between ethnology and geography. However, the geography of the Arabs had little or no influence on that of Europe, which, as far as maps were concerned, continued to be based on imagination rather than fact until Columbus's time. Meanwhile, another movement was taking place during the 8th and 9th centuries, which helped shape Europe and greatly expanded the common knowledge of northern European peoples. For the first time since the disappearance of the Phoenicians, a great naval power emerged in Norway, and within a couple of centuries it had influenced almost the entire European coastline. The Vikings, or sea rovers, who kept their long ships in the Vix, or fjords of Norway, launched vigorous attacks along the European coast and, in several cases, established stable governments. In a way, they created a sort of crust for Europe, preventing any further upheaval of its human contents. In Iceland, England, Ireland, Normandy, Sicily, and Constantinople, where they formed the Varangi, or bodyguard of the emperor, as well as in Russia, and for a time the Holy Land, Vikings or Normans founded kingdoms between which there was a lively exchange of visits and knowledge. Their voyages extended far, even to the icy shores of Greenland. It is believed that they journeyed from Greenland to Labrador and Newfoundland. In the year 1001, a man from Iceland named Bjorn was on his way to visit his father in Greenland when he was blown off course and landed in a land they called Vinland. This land was inhabited by dwarves and had the shortest day of only eight hours, which would place it at around fifty degrees north latitude. The Norsemen settled there, and as late as 1121, the Bishop of Greenland visited them in an attempt to convert them to Christianity. There is little doubt that Vinland was on the mainland of North America, making the Norsemen the first Europeans to discover America. In 1380, two Venetians named Zeno visited Iceland and reported a tradition of a land named Estotiland, located a thousand miles west of the Faroe Islands and south of Greenland. The people were said to be civilized and skilled seamen, though they were unfamiliar with the compass. To their south were savage cannibals, and even further to the southwest were other civilized people who built large cities and temples but offered up human sacrifices. This knowledge may have been related to the Mexicans. 
Maritime discovery was a challenge for the ancients and the men of the Middle Ages because they had to stay close to the shore. They could navigate by the sun during the day and by the pole star at night, but if the sky was overcast, they would become lost. The discovery of the polar tendency of the magnetic needle was crucial for extended voyages away from land. The Chinese knew about this from ancient times and used it on their junks as early as the 11th century. The Arabs, who voyaged to Ceylon and Java, learned its use from the Chinese, and it is likely that the mariners of Barcelona first introduced its use into Europe. The first mention of it is given in a treatise on natural history by Alexander Neckham, foster brother of Richard the Lionheart. In a satirical poem by the troubadour Guillot of Provence, it is stated that mariners can navigate by following the direction of a needle floating in a basin of water, after it has been touched by a magnet, even without seeing the North Star. However, this method was not widely used, as Brunetto Latini, Dante's tutor, noted during his visit to Roger Bacon in 1258. Although Bacon had shown him the magnet and its properties, Latini claimed that no master mariner would dare to use it, lest he should be thought to be a magician. At the time, the magnet was of little practical use, as it had not yet been balanced on a pivot and fixed on a card, as it is today. It was not until the beginning of the fourteenth century, when Flavio Gioja of Amalfi made this practical improvement, that the mariner's compass became an essential tool for sailors. Once the mariner's compass came into general use, master mariners could use it to determine the relative positions of different lands. This was a much more practical method than the vague statements in the itineraries of merchants and soldiers that geographers had relied on in the past. With the aid of the compass, it became possible to determine the relative position of one point to another and to map out the windings of a road on paper. While the learned monks were content with myth and fable as the basis of their maps of the world, the seamen of the Mediterranean were gradually building up charts of the sea and the neighboring lands that varied little from the true position. These charts were called portulani, as they gave information on the best routes from port to port. Baron Nordenskiold has recently shown that all these portulani are derived from a single Catalan map that has been lost, but must have been compiled between 1266 and 1291. Even some of the learned were not above taking instruction from the practical knowledge of the seamen. In the year 1339, a man named Angelico Dulcert, hailing from the island of Mallorca, crafted a grand map of the world based on the Portulano principle. This map was remarkable in its accuracy of the Mediterranean coastline. Shortly thereafter, in 1375, a Jew named Cresquez from the same island improved upon Dulcert's work by incorporating knowledge of Cathay, or China, recently acquired through the travels of Marco Polo. This map, known as the Catalan map due to the language of the inscriptions scattered throughout it, is divided into eight horizontal strips. A reduced reproduction of the Catalan map is displayed on the previous page, demonstrating the precise reproduction of the Mediterranean coastline in these Portulanos. With the Portulanos, geographical knowledge once again progressed by returning to factual representation. These maps provided mariners with an accurate depiction of the coastline, allowing them to venture more confidently and return more safely, while also providing a means for recording any further knowledge. As we shall see, they aided Prince Henry the Navigator in launching a series of geographical investigations that led to the discoveries that marked the end of the Middle Ages. With the Portulanos, we can effectively conclude the history of medieval geography as a systematic branch of knowledge. Now, we must briefly summarize the contributions to knowledge made by travelers, pilgrims, and merchants, which were recorded in the form of travel literature. Chapter 4. Medieval Travels In the Middle Ages, that is, in the thousand years between the barbarian invasion of the Roman Empire in the 5th century and the discovery of the New World in the 15th century, the primary events that impacted the expansion of knowledge include the following. The Viking voyages in the 8th and 9th centuries, the Crusades in the 12th and 13th centuries, and the growth of the Mongol Empire in the 13th and 14th centuries. The Vikings' newfound knowledge did not spread throughout Europe, while the Crusades and pilgrimages to the Holy Land merely reintroduced the knowledge of classical antiquity to Western Europe. However, the expansion of the Mongol Empire had a far-reaching impact and led to the acquisition of knowledge about Eastern Asia that the Romans did not possess and has only been surpassed in modern times. Around the beginning of the 13th century, Chinchiz Khan, the leader of a small Tatar tribe, 
conquered most of Central and Eastern Asia, including China. Under his son, Okodai, the Mongol Tatars turned their attention from China to the west, conquering Armenia. One of the Mongol generals, named Batu, ravaged South Russia and Poland, and even captured Budapest in 1241. It appeared as if the prophesied end of the world had arrived, and the mighty nations of Gog and Magog had finally emerged to fulfill the prophetic words. However, Okodai died suddenly, and the armies were recalled. Europe was gripped with universal terror, and the Pope, as the head of Christendom, resolved to send ambassadors to the great Khan to determine his true intentions. He dispatched a friar named John of Planocarpini from Lyons in 1245 to the camp of Batu on the Volga, who then sent him to the court of the great Khan at Karakorum, the capital of his empire. Only a faint trace of the city remains on the left bank of the Orkon, several hundred miles south of Lake Baikal.